you, Suki, for this opportunity to share a few highlights from my book with your audience. I wish it was possible to be there in person. Bombay is the city in which I was born and went to school and college, and it's always a pleasure to return. And welcome to all of you who have tuned in for this talk. So I have a story of India through objects. Why through objects might be your very first question. And I would counter, why ever not? We are constantly surrounded by objects. In our homes, in our offices, wherever we are, we are surrounded by all these things that enable our everyday life, that channel them and dictate them, things that we usually take for granted. But these objects all speak about us. They have a story to tell that reflects our values, our aspirations, our achievements, our dreams. And objects reveal more about us than we realize. Just think about it. You go into a person's home when it's the first time, you look around and you immediately form some judgments, right? You walk into a hotel lobby, you form some judgments. You may already have done that without even realizing it. You might have said, well, she's got flowers there and what seems to be a silver jug. And that I'm sure you formed some sort of idea about it already. So my book focuses on 100 objects to tell a story of India. How was I going to organize 100 objects? Yes, chronology was needed, but purely chronological would be deadly boring. So what I did was to have a series of thematic sections. Thematic sections like the urge to adorn or intercultural encounters or mobility and cosmopolitanism or ideals of womanhood. And I used those allowing the objects themselves to take center stage. I want to let the objects themselves speak and to shed light on the varying priorities evident over time, the differing strands of achievement that arose over the years to create what I call the rich multicultural medley that is today's India. It is a multifaceted culture that has had room for varying priorities and different points of view. That has been India's strength and that is still India's strength today. Okay, it is a story, an idiosyncratic story at that, since I'm not sure that there is such a thing as a totally neutral or detached point of view. Choosing the 100 objects was of course a difficult task, a very difficult task. Only 100 objects to tell the story of over 4,000 years. I mean, you could go further, but I was only going with 4,000 years. As you, as a reader, skim through the book, you would probably find that an object that you consider really important is not there. And so let me repeat once more that making the choices was truly difficult. And I'd love to talk about it in question time. But finally, I decided that if I can get my readers to say, really? Or who knew that I would be satisfied? that I would have achieved my aim. So let me start with one of my favorite objects. It's a beautiful piece, but it's not just its beauty. It tells us so much about the period in which it was created. So we've got an ivory figurine. She's small. She's only about nine inches high richly adorned and decorated, sensuous figure. Look at the stack of bangles from wrist to elbow and the stack of anklets from below the knee all the way down to the ankles. And then there are the necklaces and the hair ornament and the hip girdles and she's just beautiful. She is 
the exact counterpart of the images at the Sanchi Stupa near Bhopal in central India. There they are carved out of sandstone. And here is the equivalent in ivory. And it's interesting that at the Sanchi Stupa, we actually have um, an inscription which talks about the ivory carvers of Vivisha, the town right near Sanchi. You might notice the label that I have attached to this image, which says pre-79 and says Naples Museum. Okay, now we did not go to the Naples Museum in recent years. Why is it in the Naples Museum? Because it was found in the Roman town of Pompeii in Italy. And it got there before the year 79. Can you believe that? Almost 2000 years ago, it arrived in Pompeii. And how is it that it is there? Uh, it's part of the trade. And how did we discover it in the 1830s? When ex uh, archeologists started clearing the Roman town of Pompeii, which was a wealthy town, um, it was covered with about 10 feet of volcanic ash from Mount Vesuvius, which you see in the background there. That volcano erupted in the year 79 and completely covered, destroyed everything at Pompeii. What you're seeing are the ruins put together by archaeologists. She was there already in 79. She was part of this extraordinary Indo-Mediterranean trade of that period. What was part of that trade? There were ivory tusks, of course. Uh, there was fine muslin cloth that Roman ladies so wanted from India. And there was also pepper. Pepper from India was one of those things that was really sought after. We've recently found a Roman recipe book. 400 recipes, 395 of those recipes use black pepper. Black pepper, which comes from nowhere else but India, the complete West Coast, predominantly Kerala, but also Goa and, and a, a few other places. So along with this rich trade in these various goods, particularly pepper, this figurine, arrived in Pompeii and lay under the ashes for more than 1800, 1900 years until she was rediscovered. What purpose did she serve? There's a little hole in her head which goes down to her hips. And it seems that she was part of a piece of expensive furniture in wood decorated with ivory. I don't know what sort of chair you're sitting on. The one I'm sitting on has got bands at the back to support the, um, uh, just to support the back. And it is probable that that was her function. She was one of a series of images that served as the back for a wealthy aristocratic nobleman's fine furniture. And while we're talking about adornment, uh, look at these exquisite granulated gold pendants which would have been strung on a necklace. Ornament in India has more meaning than mere decoration because ornament is auspicious, awful English word. It is shubha, it is mangala, it is fortunate, it is protective. It makes the body complete and whole and beautiful. Sometimes to be without adornment is to be courting danger. Think about Draupadi, how she undid all her decorations and refused to bind up even her hair until she had secured the revenge she was looking for. So ornament is very significant. And this ornament belongs to about the same period as the yakshi, the, the figurine that we just looked at, the ivory figurine. And here you can see a 
a necklace on a sculpted image, again from a Buddhist stupa at Barhut. And you can see that the figure is wearing the pendants of a very similar type to these. And that also uh, in a rather fanciful manner, a flower that emerges in the form of these pendants. It's a gold granulated pendant. Granulation is a fantastically complicated process, speaks of the great skill of the goldsmith of that day, the gold craftsman who created it. You first create the shape and, and an assistant could have done that. And then the master goldsmith takes hundreds of tiny little balls of gold and attaches them in a very complex process. The body that you've looked at already is, as you've seen, a very rich and curvaceous and sensuous body. That is part of the Indian tradition. I'll say a few more words about it in a moment. But I want to focus on this image. This is large. I talked about a nine inch image. This is over six feet in size and it portrays, as you can see, Shiva and Parvati seated close together as a married couple as in conjugal bliss, one might say. And this particular one comes from Odisha, but images of this type are everywhere in India. You find them on the West Coast, you find them in the Himalayan foothills, you find them in the deep south, in the center, everywhere. And it is as a loving couple, you can see how Parvati has got her arm, um, hand around Shiva's shoulder, and you can see how Shiva has his arm cupping her breast. This is conjugal bliss. This is the bliss that the inscriptions that all the poems talk about. The inscriptions say, may Shiva who enjoyed an embrace from Parvati, bless me. Or if it's Vishnu and Lakshmi, it says, may Lakshmi's hand, which is caressing the neck of, of Vishnu, grant me the same bliss. Think of it in terms of prasad. You know, you take prasad when you, uh, if you're a Hindu and you go into a temple to worship, you carry a tray of offerings, which could carry maybe half a coconut, a banana, a few flowers. The priest takes it from you, offers it to the deity, and then gives you perhaps a little bit of it back. Maybe one banana, maybe a piece of coconut, maybe one of the flowers. When offerings were made either as a poetic offering or in actual physical form, as in this case in stone, the offering is made to the temple of God and goddess as a happily married couple. And the prasad that you get back is a fraction of that for your own happiness. And talking about the sensuous imagery, it was believed that bodily beauty had to go hand in hand with spiritual beauty. The, they, the Indians of ancient times did not separate those two. They believed that they went together, that they were inseparable, which is why our deities are always beautiful bodied figures that also reflects their divinity and their spiritual beauty. Moving to a different type of body, the yogic body. I mean, sitting in a yogic posture is absolutely common and it arose automatically in a country in which people comfortably sat on the ground and still comfortably sit on the ground. And when they are raised on a throne, as with the image, the Buddha image on the lower left, um, you just treated that seat as your as the ground and sat similarly cross-legged upon it. The contribution of India to the vocabulary of world art is this form of the yogic figure sitting with legs crossed in lotus posture, meditating and, and the fact that it is of very early date, you can see from these two seals on both ends of your screen, which come from the Indus civilization. 
which was at its height from about 2600 BCE to about 1900 BCE. So we're talking way beyond 4,000 years ago. Um, yoga was established and it was common long before Patanjali wrote his Yoga Sutras, which he may have written maybe in the fourth century of this era. Uh, and of course, it is one of those exports of India uh, across the world. Yoga now has completely taken over. Um, there was some discussion recently suggesting that standing yoga poses are a recent introduction. But honestly, if you look at the actual imagery, you see that it is there from very ancient times. We're looking at the great cliff face at Mahabalipuram, Mamalapuram, south of Chennai. And you can see clearly the figure of the ascetic on the top and the figure of the false ascetic cat in, on the lower right in standing poses which were carved before the year 700. So it's not of that recent. It is a long established tradition in India. Moving to scientific achievements, one of the most interesting and stunning is the fact that the use, use of zero is an Indian innovation. Yes, there are a couple of other cultures that thought of the zero, but they never used it in the mathematical sense in which it is used universally today. You put a one and then you add a zero to it, it becomes 10. You add another zero, it becomes 100. You add another zero, it becomes 1,000. That concept was not thought of by anybody else who came up with a shell form, the ancient Incas uh, or one other culture, Babylonia in ancient times. So zero, which stands for nothing, but this absolutely important nothing is an Indian introduction. And at the other end of the scale, infinity, an impossibly large number that you can't even comprehend, a number so large that anything you remove from it makes no difference to it. Anything you add to it makes no difference to it. Infinity, ananta. Isn't it interesting to think that nothingness, nothing, zero, and infinity, everything you can possibly imagine, are both comfortably accommodated <clears throat> in India, in Indian thought, in mathematics. And I would imagine it was so comfortably accommodated because it was also part of the Indi of Indian spiritual thinking. There is this idea of the void, of nothingness, of shunyata. And then on the other hand, there is the infinity, the infinite power of the Supreme, the Ananta. And it seems as if mathematical thought went side by side with Indian philosophical thought to make these two concepts be accepted comfortably in the Indian system of things, whether it was mathematical or it was spiritual. And this particular Burke Park manuscript recently dated by carbon dating to the fourth century tells you how long it probably was there before, because this is not a spiritual manuscript. It's actually an account book of merchants. Uh, it was certainly, this is not the first time it appeared, but this is the first time we see it and can date it. The Indian Ocean Rim, and particularly the countries to, to, in, to the southeast of us, whether it's Thailand or it's Java or it's Cambodia or Sri Lanka are filled with Hindu, Buddhist, 
deities that moved at an early date from India across the ocean and established themselves in these countries and then developed in their own way. But I'm not going to talk about them. I'm going to talk about the image that I haven't yet had a label on, which is a linga. And it is a mukha linga, as you see, with the, uh, you've got the, the sort of pillar-like form that stands for the power of Shiva in every way. Uh, it's a mukha linga, which has the head of Shiva against it. But it is in marble. And the extraordinary thing is that it comes from Afghanistan. Afghanistan, a country that today we associate with Islam, we associate with war, tribal warfare, which we associate also with Western intervention. But Afghanistan, before the start of the Ghaznavid dynasty, was a very, very different place. Early Afghanistan was the center of Buddhist culture. And then later on, between about 840 and 1040, it was a Hindu country. It was ruled by the Hindu Shahis. The Shahi probably comes from Shah. And the rulers were primarily worshippers of Shiva. There is a ruler who comes to the throne in 1004 who has left us an inscription calling himself Maharaja Di Raja Parameshwara. He's the worshiper of Shiva and he has a verse describing the beauty of Shiva who has a third eye in his forehead. And he talks about establishing a temple to Shiva. And it must have been in one such Shiva temple in Afghanistan in pre ghaznavid days that this Shiva Linga in marble was once installed. It's quite a thought, isn't it, about how extensively the culture that we think of as India actually extended. Here is another example of how far it extended. The painting you're looking at is actually an Iranian painting. And the little detail shows you the story of the tortoise and the geese. And this story goes back to the Buddhist Jatakas, which I'll talk about in a minute, which is what you see on the bottom right, where you can see the same in stone. And I'll speak about that. It also goes back to the Panchatantra. But what is the story? It is that the little pond in which the tortoise and the geese are living is drying up and the geese decide they have to go fly north to somewhere where there is more water. They don't want to leave their friend the tortoise behind and so they come up with this plan. They tell the tortoise to hold on to a stick that the two of them are going to hold in their beaks. They warn the tortoise, do not open your mouth and we will take you to safety with us. And of course, we don't see the conclusion of the story there, but you do see it in the Buddhist Jataka. The people down below are pointing out in the villages that they pass through saying, wonder if this tortoise is being abducted, being kidnapped or something like that. And of course the tortoise forgetting the promise not to open her mouth, wants to answer and opens her mouth and she, of course, falls to her death. And this Buddhist Jataka scene, um, which you see here up on top is the flying figures and down here after she falls when these villagers all cluster around her. So what am I trying to point am I trying to make here? These stories of talking animals are part of the general social cultural milieu of early India. We know of the Panchatantra, which may have been written in, it was written in Sanskrit, it may have been written around the year 300. Um, and some of you probably know this, but there is this king who has three sons who just refuse to take an interest in governing. And he's very anxious and he finds a Brahmin and says, for God's sake, teach them something about how to run a kingdom. 
And the Brahmin comes up with these fantastic stories. In this case, the, the, it is the story, the moral is do not indulge in unnecessary speech. It can get you into trouble. Um, but he tells them these various stories that deal with friendships, with making alliances, with strategies for success, all animal stories. And the princes imbibe all of this and are ready to govern the kingdom without even realizing that they have been taught a variety of lessons. Those stories circulated widely. They went into the Jatakas, which are the stories of the Buddha's previous lives. And there are 500 of them. And this particular story features as number 215 in the Jatakas. So it is then translated first into Arabic, from Arabic into Persian. There are multiple versions, painted versions in the Islamic world of these stories. And there are faint echoes later in Europe in the Thousand and One Nights and other stories like that. Uh, it's quite an amazing adventure to follow the, the way in which some of these stories moved across space, time, and languages. So we're looking now at an Islamic gravestone. It is made of marble and it was made in Kambat, Kambay as we used to call it, in Gujarat in the 15th century. More importantly is for my no, story, it was found in Aden. And it is quite extraordinary. So what do we have here? We've got a beautifully carved gravestone with absolutely gorgeous Islamic lettering in the Tulip script, among the finest that you find anywhere in the world as far as the script is concerned. And what we find is these gravestones are across the Indian Ocean rim once again. We find them in Trincomalee, which is Sri Lanka. We found 12 of them in Sumatra, which is one of the largest of the Indonesian islands. Uh, we found them elsewhere in the, in the Far East. When you move to the Western boundaries, we found them in Somalia, we found them in Oman, we found them in Mogadishu, we've even found them in coastal Iran, Lars, the province of Lars. So in the 15th century, Kambat was a center of marble carving. The marble, local marble was greatly admired. The marble carvers were experts. Gujarat at that time was under Islamic rule. It had been under Islamic rule for quite a while under the Kilji and Tughlaq rulers. But in the 15th century, it was an independent sultanate of its own. And Ahmad Khan established Ahmedabad as its capital. And from here, we've got the inscription which gives you the name and the date of death of the particular person. They are all highly placed. They are sultans in Sumatra. They are imams uh, who have ordered these. And these are heavy things. Marble about three feet in height and weighing 300 pounds, but shipped across the, the, the Indian Ocean rim from Kambat. Tells you one of the important things I think these objects will tell you is that India was never isolated from the world. We tend to think of, of globalization as a 20th century phenomenon. Come on, it's been there all along. It was always in touch with the rest of the world and often was the source of important materials, um, whether they be pepper, uh, uh, consumer goods, or incense, or whether they be marble carving, such as this. Let me focus first on the image on the left, which you see Jahangir and Jesus on an album page from an album, a murakka as, they, as it's known, uh, belonging to Emperor Jahangir, 
who you see in the top portrait. These albums are something like, uh, to use something colloquial, like a scrapbook in which you would cut out and paste together your favorite pictures. And that is exactly what this Muraka is. It's not the emperor himself. It is skilled artists who have taken images that the emperor really appreciated, put them together, pasted them, created new borders and created pages for these gorgeous albums of Emperor Jahangir. And what are you seeing? You're seeing a portrait of Jahangir on the right. And the artist has put his signature in the white band on the left, on the right, if you can see my arrow. And similarly, there's another artist, a different artist, who painted the image of Christ bearing the cross. And that has been combined with a new border in white first, and then a floral border with calligraphy and yet another border to create this wonderful album page. Why the Christian imagery? Because Jahangir's father, Akbar, um, the, the Jesuits were invited by Akbar to visit the Mughal court. And they came bearing the Antwerp Bible known as the Polyglot Bible. And Akbar was interested and asked his um, artists to copy images from that. And this continued during Jahangir's time. And this copying was not necessarily because they were interested in the religious philosophy or the religion of Christianity as such, more that they were interested in novel subject matter and they were willing to know more about various faiths. Christianity, of course, came quite early to India, but the Catholic faith came much later. And I turn now to the image on the right, this fantastic pelican of silver on a globe-shaped base, which is actually wood covered with silver. And it comes from Goa. Catholicism, of course, came to India with Vasco da Gama in 1498. He didn't come straight to Goa, he went to Calicut. Um, and this is a tabernacle monstrance. What on earth is that? In, in this circle in the center of the breast of the bird is a, is a container, a circular container, which is intended to carry a wafer, which in the Catholic system of worship stands for the body of Christ. That body that he sacrificed, the ultimate sacrifice to save mankind. And so it would have been the central object of worship in one of the many Catholic churches, even cathedrals that we find in Goa. Um, in the beginning, objects were imported from Portugal and elsewhere, other Portuguese colonies, but this image was probably made, it is late enough, it was made probably by Indian craftsmen who were working at that time, Goan craftsmen, shall we call them, who were working for Portuguese, with Portuguese commissions. So here I'm showing you two images of the god Krishna. On the left is a Chola bronze a fantastic image of Krishna who has defeated this great serpent Kaliya who lives on the, in the Jamna river and whose poison is polluting the waters of the Jamna and therefore threatening the life and livelihood of the people who live on the banks of the Jamna. The image on the left, the Chola bronze, is an object of worship that would have been in a temple to Krishna or maybe to Vishnu himself and would have been an object of, of worship. What are we seeing on the right? We are seeing a page from a Mughal manuscript, an Akbar manuscript, which is showing us that same story. And in the center, you see the yellow clad Krishna, you know, he always wears yellow robes, crowned Krishna playing on his flute 
on a very similar, but a different uh, visualization. He's standing on the arms on the left. He's standing on the hood of the defeated serpent who has capitulated and agreed not to terrorize the area. Mughal manuscript. It's Akbar again that we have to turn to. Akbar, I already told you about the Jesuit Akbar. Akbar was interested in all religions. He invited everybody. He invited the Jains. He invited the Zoroastrians. Uh, he, of course, invited Hindus and went to see Hindus. So that we have this amazing uh, openness. He actually got his um, courtier, one of his courtiers, to translate the Ramayana and Mahabharata into Persian and then asked his artist to illustrate it. So this page comes from one of those manuscripts made for Akbar. It's a manuscript that sort of speaks to the openness, the willingness to learn about other faiths that is so much a hallmark of India throughout the ages, down the ages. Jain Kalpa Sutras, Jain, important Jain manuscripts. We all know that Western India has always been a Jain stronghold. It is a extremely wealthy merchant community trading community of James who has lived there. Um, they had money and the wherewithal from trade and they used it to build marble temples. We all know of temples like Dilwara and Ranakpur. They also had copies made of the sacred manuscripts, including the Kalpa Sutra, which is one of the most sacred of manuscripts. And they, spent lavishly on it, as you can see. The entire writing is in gold. And then, of course, you can see how much more gold there is on these pages. And then there is blue, extremely expensive imported lapis lazuli, which is used for blue, and the vibrant red. And then when you look more closely, you see the wonderfully textured, patterned fabrics that are such an important feature of Gujarat. Um, this particular manuscript was uh, commissioned by two bankers from the town of Broch, Barukacha, as, as it was known in ancient times. And then if we move to a different type of manuscript, a Quran, which was produced in the year 1399 in Gwalior. Gwalior was under Rajput rule at that time. The Tonbar Rajputs were ruling Gwalior. So it's very interesting to see a richly illustrated Quran. This is one page. The Quran has, this Quran has 250 pages and each one of them is as lavishly adorned as this. Look a little bit closely. Normally, this is not a normal Quran as a standard Quran. Qurans normally only have the written word. You would have it written in Arabic and it would just be the written word. Here you can see one, two, three, four, five lines of written word. But what do we have here? In the midst, dividing almost each of these lines of Quranic verses, we've got this exuberant, lush flowers and foliage, absolutely unheard of in any other part of the world for a Quran. Uh, it is the word and the word that is supreme and it is the word alone in the Arabic script that rules. But here, the, the artist has taken over the vocabulary of the Jain and Hindu carvers who were carving this sort of exuberant foliage to adorn pillar shafts in temples. And he has introduced them here. If whenever you see something like this, you can immediately say it has to be early India because nowhere else 
would you find a Quran page with anything but the word, the word of God in the Arabic language? We know very little about how this Quran was produced in Gwalior at this period of time, but it is an absolutely exquisite piece of, of uh, calligraphy and adornment that we see. Or we could turn, of course, to a Ramayana page. How could we leave without the Ramayana? Uh, this one is made by, uh, is made for the ruler Jagat Singh, who was the uh, Mewar uh, ruler uh, of Udaipur, stationed in Udaipur. And the, it, the really important thing I'd like to point out, and I notice it's not in the um, label at the bottom, is that Jagat Singh, who was obviously was a Hindu ruler, his master artist was Sahib Din, a Muslim who was his master artist and who produced multiple Hindu manuscripts for his Hindu ruler. And this particular manuscript, the Ramayana, he says that in, in the colophon, which is the last page, which gives a name, the date, the place where it was made, he says there that he made it for the viewing pleasure of his Rana. So we've got to remember this idea that you can have a Hindu ruler and a Muslim artist. You can have a Muslim ruler and Hindu artists. Many of Akbar's and Jahangir's pages were created by, painted by Hindu artists. That the, the, the religion professed by the, the artist and that professed by the person who's commissioning it did not have to match. That an artist would work for whichever patron commissioned his services. So this is a page from the Ramayana, which contains 10 different episodes. And you can unravel them usually by seeing the repetition of the figure. And the most obvious figure, of course, is 10-headed Ravana. And you can see him here twice, once in the upper right and then once a little bit below. And what the artist has done here is to take a story that is so well known, the Ramayana, and create it for the viewing pleasure of his Rana. He's, he says, I'm going to give you 10 episodes on this page. You are going to unravel it because you know the story. And what is the story? It is Ravana's son, Indrajit coming to meet his father and they make a plan. And of course the plan is that Indrajit has a weapon that turns into serpents when he shoots the arrows. And if you look on the left side of the page, and if my arrow functions, you will see that you've got Rama here in blue and, and Lakshmana next to him, all bound by snakes. Up here is Indrajit whom you see about seven times on this page. You see him entering, you see him going into Ravana's presence, you see him embracing Ravana, you see him seated here, planning, you see him leaving. Anyway, he has shot these arrows and the story still continues because Sita is here and she's taken to be shown this saying, you might as well give in, your husband is dead sort of thing. I move to a very different type of um, object that speaks greatly about what I would rather call deshi art. You could call it folk, you could call it tribal. Uh, all those words seem to have acquired connotations. And so I'm using the word deshi. Uh, this is a Buddha figure from coastal Canada, from the region of Udupi. And it's almost six feet tall. They come in all sizes, three feet, four, five, six feet is about the largest. They're, this one is created out of the wood of the jackfruit tree. And it's a local deity called a Buddha. Number of Buddhas are known in this area. All of them have names which end in either Amma or Taye, both of which of course mean mother. They are of local significance. They're Deshi figures. In the area in which they reign supreme, it could be only a 50 mile radius in all directions. They are supreme. 50 miles away, 
they're not heard of. Here's another example, which is, of course, Buster imagery from Chhattisgarh, where and Buster images have a sort of a braided texture to the metal, and you recognize them from that. Once again, female divinity, they are not entirely female, but female divinities predominate here. And this is Mitki with a basket, which she always carries. And sometimes, as you see in the far right, that basket on its own stands in for her. Again, these deities are important only in the Basta region. You move 50 miles away, and there is another very important but very localized belief in Deshi deities. What are we looking at here? We are looking at four game pieces from a set. There's a whole series of, of 16 of these. Um, and the game, of course, is Pachisi or Chaupat. All these games are sort of games of war, if you want to think of them that way. You've probably thought about chess, which is certainly a war game and was probably invented in India. But Chisi or Chapat is a little different from chess in that it is the speed of achieving your goal that counts and makes you the winner. And you have game pieces in four different colors. White, green, blue, and red. Uh, and here, I'm of course, the um, white is diamonds, the green is emerald, the blue is sapphire, the red is ruby, they're gorgeous. And you can also see if my, the, the, the dice, the dice in India are always, there are three of them and they're always these rectangular pieces. And here is the board, if you want to call it a board, it's a piece of fabric embroidered on which this game was played. And if you look at the painting on the upper right, you can see Shiva and Parvati seated playing exactly this game. And here, if you look very closely in this upper segment are three dice uh, that are placed there. You get an idea from this that gaming was a popular pastime always, and that it was definitely, we have got many paintings showing uh, rulers and their families playing it. You also see, of course, Shiva and Parvati. And in the rock cut caves all around Bombay, reaching as far as Elora, you often see them in rock cut sculpture playing the same game. These are beautiful, absolutely exquisite jeweled pieces that come from a court somewhere in probably the Rajasthan region. So gaming is an accepted pastime. <laughs> we all know of the infamous gaming that occurred in the Mahabharata of when Yudhishthira loses everything to his Kaurava rivals. Interestingly, the exact nature of that game, it's passed over in the epic and We've tried to pin it down, and it could have been Pachisi or Chalpat, but we don't actually know. Isn't it interesting that one of the most famous episodes of the Mahabharata, which really catapults the whole thing into this Maha war, uh, is something that we are not told what the game is. Women. Women in India, yes, they have always had, they've recently had quite a high position. You can talk about prime ministers, and presidents, members of parliament, governors, ministers of center and state. And then of course, there is the goddess herself, Ma, Devi. You would imagine that the position of women would be a good one, unfortunately. It has not turned out to be so, but there have been exceptional women down the ages, and I deal with some of them. Today, I'm going to just talk to you about Noor Jahan. She was the 
wife of Emperor Jahangir, whom we have already encountered in the page of Jahangir and Christ in, in his album. Just look at this figure. She's holding a matchlock musket. Look how casually she's holding it with her left hand. It weighs all of 15 pounds minimum. She's holding it. And then she's got her right hand up with the scouring stick. She's pushing down, tamping down the gunpowder into the muzzle of this musket in order to fire it. It's called a matchlock because if you look very carefully, you will see the curved, um, match, which is actually uh, rope with which this um, musket is fired. And if you look again, you will see that she has slung from her patka, from her sash, um, the, the container for the gunpowder that she has just tamped, she's just tamping down into the musket. Um, if you look very carefully, uh, you will see that she's got henna decorating her hands and her feet. Um, so this is a strong portrait of a strong woman who is effortlessly handling a musket. And I have to say that this is not just a, a mere artist's fantasy. She was known to be an expert markswoman who could shoot tigers very easily. And we actually have Jahangir's own words for this. Uh, we have his, the memoirs of his reign, which are called the Tuzuki Jahangiri. And in that he writes two or three instances. And maybe I would read to you one of these instances where it is in um, 1615, we actually have the date and it's in the book, June 15th or something like that, where she, they go hunting tigers and it is Nur Jahan who fires the shots that kill them. So that Jahangir writes admiringly, until now, such shooting was never seen that from the top of an elephant and inside of a howdah, six shots could be made and not one miss, so that the four beasts found no opportunity to spring or move. Quite a testament to her marks, marksmanship skills. Jahangir Noor was an extraordinary woman. Jahangir relied on her increasingly for, to govern his empire. And she gave audience, she issued firmans, which are orders, which normally only Jahangir would be issuing only the monarch. And she acquired such power that by 1617, gold and silver coins were issued by the Mughal court with Jahangir's name on one side and Nur Jahan's name on the other side of the same coin. In early 17th century Mughal India, Nur was a woman definitely to be reckoned with. This is the image that was chosen to be on the cover of the book. It is an absolutely gorgeous enameled piece inset with all manner of gemstones, with rubies, with emeralds, with sapphire, with diamonds, with onyx. They've all been skillfully cut and inlaid into the gold and the white that you see at the lower breast of the bird is all white enamel. I, I think that she is this bird, she, he, uh, this bird is the possession of Emperor Shah Jahan himself. That Shah Jahan who of course was responsible for the Taj Mahal, that Shah Jahan who ordered the peacock throne, the famous or infamous peacock throne that was taken by Nadir Shah of Persia and it's never been, was dismantled into all its individual gems um, and has never been seen since that time. Shah Jahan, who was a connoisseur of gems and who claimed to be able to tell a, a, a ruby or a diamond of infinite value from that which had certain flaws in it. 
And the reason we think that it is probably the personal possession of Emperor Shah Jahan is apart from its great beauty, on the rear of its perch, just where the tail of the bird is over here on the rear, there's a plain, there's plain gold which hasn't been inset. And on it is inscribed the name Ruzbihan. And Ruzbihan we know from Shah Jahan's memoirs and from the records of his reign was the name of the person who was in charge of his private treasures. And with that name inscribed on it, we assume that this was something that Shah Jahan himself had commissioned, which he might have kept close to him. Um, it was probably a, a jeweled perch on which it was displayed. Here is just a plain steel bar that you're seeing on which it is now displayed in the museum. Um, and in Sufi uh, belief, the falcon returning to perch on the hand of its owner was considered to be the soul returning to God. So it has, apart from being an absolutely beautiful object, it also has a connotation, a sacred connotation in, in terms of Sufism. So what do we have here? We have a ketuba, which is a marriage contract, a Jewish marriage contract. So we all know that there are Jewish synagogues and that Kochi was originally a Jewish stronghold. From a, the early 1300s, it became the main stronghold of the Jews. The Jews came to India earlier. There's a little doubt as to when they arrived, but it's quite possible that they arrived as early as the fifth century. But in later times, Kochi became their stronghold. And what are we seeing here in this marriage contract, which of course, as you can see, has great amount of gold on it. The upper circle uh, on the top here has got um, a, 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 a Jewish prayer written in the standard Hebrew script. It is when you move down here that you see written in a local Kerala script, uh, the actual marriage contract between the two people and the date of the marriage. And um, parrots, parrots very often adorn these marriage contracts and parrots have a significance in the Jewish uh, belief system. There's a series of songs called the Shingli songs, uh, which are Jewish songs in which the dispersal of parrots is compared to the dispersal of the Jews around the world. And as a footnote to that, I should say that in the 1950s, a large community of Jews from Kochi um, voluntarily migrated to Israel and live there now and are known as the Kochinen. And what about the Parsis? And this silver bowl made in Raj, India, made in Bombay, perhaps in the year, uh, around the year uh, 1890. There was a thriving uh, manufacture of silver objects in Raj, India. Mostly they were items created for the British, for British use so that you have tea services and claret jugs and beer mugs and christening mugs, everything that the British used. Uh, and there are different types of decoration in different parts of India. But this one from Bombay is obviously a Parsi bowl. It carries two famous scenes from Zoroastrian context. Uh, on the left, you see in the center, the figure within a flying sort of figure, which uh, is known as a Fravashi and stands for, of course, the great 
being Ahura Mazda and you've got Darius the king. This is a copy of a very famous Besutun relief in Iran, in ancient Persia. And here on the right is another scene, again, a stone rock cut scene from Persia, um, which belongs to the second and third centuries of this era that has been reproduced here. So what are these scenes? How did these scenes from ancient Persia, which were rock cutting, come to be transferred on to a bowl? Well, we know that there was an Iranian scholar who wrote a book on the history of Iran and its, its major imagery, and that it was published, translated and published in Bombay, as it was then, by a major Parsi um, donor. And clearly, although he has not left us his inscription on this bowl, clearly it was somebody like him who had access to this book, which is now published in Bombay and therefore widely available to the Parsi community, who decided and gave the artists, presumably the, the book from which to copy these figures onto this Parsi bowl. I talked earlier about Fars in southern Iran where the Kambat uh, gravestones went. Fars is Pars from which is Parsi. And I'm going to end with this image of contemporary Indian work. Mrinalini Mukherjee. I don't know what you think of when you think of contemporary. Maybe you think of works on acrylic, maybe you think of mylar, maybe you think of installations, maybe you think of videos. But Mrinalini Mukherjee decided that she was going to take an absolutely common everyday fabric rope. And she was going to use that to create images in the world of high art. So this rope is not, is, she created these extraordinary forms that are freestanding almost. They are at least life-size, sometimes much more than life-size. She didn't use a loom, she used her fingers finger aching ingenuity, one, one scholar has called it. And she knotted this, she wove it, she dyed it, she dried it, and then she put it all together, working from the bottom up. She had a removable armature in the middle to hold the shape. And that of course was removed when the piece was finally ready and created these awesome pieces, really awesome imagery um, that absolutely astounds you. Um, the title given to her by one scholar who's written about her um, extensively is the mistress of texture. And just look at the different types of texture that you see that create this three-dimensionality and this modeling. Um, it is ab absolutely amazing work. Let me stop there um, so that I can have some time for you to express questions, thoughts, ideas. And I'm going to stop share so that we can go back to um, to Suki, who will try and field question time. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, that was so um, enthralling because both the subject matter and your delivery were just a potent combination. I, I, I can imagine all of us just being spellbound. Mm.
by what you were telling us. So uh, thank you so much for that. We do have a few uh, questions. I mean, of course, there are a lot of compliments that have come on the chat, both in the uh, uh, in what you can see and what, what have come to us. Uh, but let me just ask you a couple of questions. Uh, you know, I, I know Gauri uh, said that she found the whole um, presentation fascinating. Ashish Kuvilkar had asked whether, yeah. um, uh, you know, you showed the first ivory image. Uh, what is the methodology to estimate, or is there a methodology to estimate how many man years it might have taken uh, to make these objects? A, a very good question. And we know so little about the artists themselves who created these works. Most of the time we know about the consumers, the people who commissioned it or the people who bought it, unfortunately. Um, what evidence do we have to go by? Um, only the, say, the Sanchi stupa itself and the fact that there are inscriptions on it and references to a ruler, um, which suggests to us that at Sanchi, the carving, which was, of course, in sandstone, might have taken a maximum of 50 years. And, and there's a lot of carving there. How long would one of these have taken? Ivory carving is, ivory is a hard medium, although it's softer than stone. We don't really know. Could it have taken a month? Could it have taken something of that sort? We are really in the dark. We are sort of looking for answers. So any suggestions that you might have or any of your own experience, please pass it on. Yeah, some, some food for thought for everyone here. Um, you know, there's another question about, you, you know, uh, it really comes through that there was so much more uh, globalization, as you called it, then, uh, while we think of, uh, you know, globalization only being a thing of current times. Uh, but how different was this? Well, do you think the common man was uh, sort of exposed to it? Or was it, uh, you know, just, you know, very um, sort of trader level? Um, so it was, it was largely a trading network. Even the movement to Southeast Asia, to Thailand, to Indonesia, to all these countries where we find Hindu and Buddhist art uh, was uh, merchant traders who went there. I mean, think about the name given to Indonesia, Suvarna Bhumi, the land of gold you were able to make money with, with, by, doing, by going to places like that. So it was, it was the merchants and traders were very involved with that and they were the ones who actually met with the people. But on the other hand, um, let me give you one little instance. We have a, a log book, a sailor's log book written in Greek of a sailor and it belongs to the first century to the exact period of, um, of this um, little ivory figurine. Uh, it's dated to that period. And it's a log book, so it's very practical and it deals just with practicalities. And it tells you, for instance, it talks about the entry into the port of Bharukacha, again, brooch. And it tells you it's very treacherous. There are lots of rocks there. It's best that you send a little boat out and the, the ruler of that air, the, the headman of that port will send a tug out that will tug you through the waters and not let you run aground on any of the rocks and get there. So once you got to the port, there would be, Bombay is a perfect example, Mumbai today. You know the amount of workers and people at the port, at any port that are offloading objects and reloading goods. So the people in those ports and what are the ports they talk of? They talk of Barukacha, they talk of Sopara, they talk of Kalyan, the, all the ports in the, in the immediate Bombay region where these ships come 
from the Mediterranean, from Aden, but originally Mediterranean goods in Aden and across through Arab middlemen. And then they load stuff and take it back. Um, there are other ships that go down to Kerala and, and then there are ships that go all the way to China. A little later, the ships from, if India is in the center, so ships from China, sh ships from the Mediterranean side all come to either South India or to Sri Lanka. They exchange goods and then they go back. So the people in these ports that we hear a lot about customs duties, for instance, in Sri Lanka, we've got a ruler who says, who's devout, follower of the Buddha. And he said, I'm giving the customs duties that would have accrued to me to the Buddhist Vihara on top of the hill. So the, the, the common person would have encountered these traders. And many of the traders coming from the East were called Yavanas. The word Yavana comes from Ionia, Ionians, which is Greek. And these Yavanas they seem to have become an expatriate community living in the Bombay region. You go to a cave site like Karle and you've got any number of inscriptions, donations of a pillar of a sculpture from a Yavana named Dhammarakita. So somebody who has lived in India long enough still retains his expatriate uh, identity as a Yavana, but his name is Dhammarakita. He's a Buddhist, now he is converted to Buddhism. So there are these communities that are living along here and intermingling. It's, it's, a, it's a fascinating period. And we are sort of pulling the threads from here and there. We don't have actual clear documentation. And of course, the, the, the general population consumed the products. So the pepper, like you said, in all the Roman recipes was what how they uh, experienced that globalization. Yes, that, that there was a demand for it. Yeah. And, and that apparently wine, believe it or not, is something that came into India. Uh, people from different uh, cultures, uh, different religions were mingling and meeting, but there was a lot more acceptance. So what changed? And does art show that change? Um, that's a complex and difficult question to answer, isn't it? Um, I think it's a very recent change. I think that in certain parts of India, these changes are more evident. Um, for instance, in I was born in Bombay but I am a Tambram, a Tamilian. And I grew up in the South in a region where it was quite normal for all my friends to be, I never even thought of them as Muslims. Um, they were fellow Tamilians. They spoke Tamil, they spoke the language. Yes, they would have gone to do their prayer if they were at, at certain times and on certain days, but it didn't, it didn't intrude. Maybe, I, I really do think that it's uh, much more evident in Northern India than in the South. Um, and I think it is also becoming more of an issue, which it, need not be at all, but it seems to have become more of an issue today. And when you think about it, at a certain stage, it didn't matter. I mean, how many people know that Nargis, who is, you know, the most famous actress, is a Muslim? And how many people know her original name? Or, you know, the, the most famous movie stars uh, whom we think of who took names that don't immediately reveal what you are as their stage name. Um, and if we can accept that all of, Hind much of Hindustani music, I mean, you know, there is a Ravi Shankar in the middle of it, but there's Vilayat Khan and there's Amjad Ali Khan and there, that are, is always been 
been accepted. We call it Indian music. We call it North Indian music. Um, I mean, never think of the of, of religion as being important. And I hope very much that we can still continue to think in those terms. True. So there is a question. Uh, how did you, um, you know, what was your thought process as you put together so many objects and their stories in your book, you know, uh, something a little bit more about your thinking in selecting these objects? Um, okay, well, I have been involved in this field of art history for all my career. So that's a large number of years. And I've been teaching it as well. Um, with the result, and, and, and going into museums is absolutely something that we all do when we are not in India, in which case we go to the sites themselves, um, but also to the museums. And so a certain number of the objects were objects that I have known well, that I have taught entire courses on that Ramayana, for instance, is at least the, the Jagat Singh Ramayana. I do one whole class on that Ramayana. It's a fascinating manuscript. So some of the objects, uh, just through my experience with teaching and with students who ask questions, um, were obvious. And then there was the question of 100. We toyed with 101, but stayed with 100. Um, and then it was a question of saying, if this is to represent India, there should be a representation from different parts of India. How do I not, I mean, it's, it's very easy as a Tamilian, particularly, and I've written several books on Chola bronzes. I could go with Chola bronzes and, I had to cut them out and say, no, there are too many Chola bronzes. We've got to have a proper balance. I need another object to tell this story. Uh, so it was quite a difficult process. Um, early on, having decided it was objects that cut out even a famous monument like the Taj Mahal had to be omitted because then that would become an architectural history and that was not what I wanted. I wanted to be able to talk about the goldsmith who would put together that amazing granulated uh, piece of jewelry or the craftsman who created in marble the um, Islamic gravestone or the artist who, who took a Quran and put all this fabulous um, floral and vegetal design into it. Um, so I can tell you that it was very difficult. There were things that were there, which fell out. There were things that were added. And, and finally, as I said, I just said, you know, if I can get my readers to just say, really? Uh, even if they have criticism saying, why isn't this there? Or why isn't something else there? I said, that's okay. Um, it, it's impossible to do the perfect job. So I will, do choose the objects that have spoken to me and hope that they will speak to the readers, the viewers of the book. So it was a tough job, tough decision. I would love to take a peek into your long list because I think that would be an amazing collection of, or rather a ref reflection of, uh, you know, collection of the past. So it's <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, uh, a lot of people are very keen to know uh, how they can get hold of your book and whether it will be available uh, only in India or whether the book is available outside India as well. Uh, so a lot of people are asking um, about that. In India, it's very readily available and has been for quite some time. So I imagine it's on Amazon or it's on whatever um mail order service you use if you're not in a city where the bookshop's carrying it. It's also available on amazon.com, both in the UK and in the US. All right. That much I do know. Yeah. Recently, it's only from September that it arrived into the UK and US. 
Okay, so that, that answers Girish's question. Um, you know, uh, you showed Miranalini Mukherjee's knotted hemp uh, as a very contemporary piece, but Avi would not to know would like to know what kind of legacy uh, would you show from this period, thousand years from now. That is a very tricky question. You are causing me to really move back. I guess you could say that maybe Subodh Gupta or Manalini Mukherjee will still feature, um, but they would feature as a part of the past. And the two artists I mentioned, I mean, Subodh Gupta is, I suppose, best known for his use of stainless steel items to make his art. Both of them are using commonplace items to create high art. Um, what else I would use? That's a tough order to answer because I've never thought about it in those terms. So I will have to ask you to indulge me. And perhaps you would let me know what you think one of the objects might be that you would suggest. I would um, ask everyone to think about it, but personally, I feel that, uh, uh, you know, everything moving on to uh, the digital media is actually taking me away from, actually, you know, the physical aspect uh, of art, including, uh, you know, photographs that are no longer printed and are sitting only in the digital media, but uh, I'm sure that we'll invite our uh, audience to comment on this in social media and tell us about what they think uh, would qualify as a representation of art thousand years from today. So um, uh, with that, um, we come to an end uh, of the session. Thank you so much. You uh, absolutely, like I said, had us uh, enthralled and we look forward to uh, putting this, uh, you know, purchasing this book and um, going through it in great detail. Thank you so much. Thank you audience for your lovely questions and for your patience. Thank you for being there. Yes, thank you to my audience. It's been a pleasure. And thank you, Suki. Thank you. <laughs>